So we're, uh, the Battle of Agincourt took place in 1415. This play was probably written around 1598, 1599. So Shakespeare is dealing with events that are roughly two centuries uh, earlier. Uh, that's pretty close to his own day, closer than the events of ancient Rome. This is England he's writing about. So as I was saying last time, uh, if we want to find some connections to Shakespeare's own day, especially in the political aspects of the plays. Henry V is a good place uh, to do that. But I was also trying to suggest that he very much keeps Rome in mind when he's writing about uh, English history. Uh, and just to uh, kind of give you a sense of where we're going, uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, uh, from what he's learned about Rome, and again, he wrote the Coriolanus and Antony Cleopatra, uh, considerably later in this play, but his next play probably was Julius Caesar in terms of chronological order of composition. So he's, he's clearly thinking about Rome uh, in writing this play in his earlier history plays, particularly the Henry VI plays, but also Richard III. Uh, he's constantly referring to Rome. And uh, I believe that he's trying to take some lessons he's learned from studying the Roman Republic and apply them to the British monarchy. I do not believe that Shakespeare uh, actively sought to convert Britain to a, a republic. Uh, though it's always interesting to realize that by the 1640s, England did become a republic in a revolution. So there was some thinking about that possibility somewhere in England. But I'm not claiming that Shakespeare wanted to make an Eng England a republic. But I do think he was hoping to reform the monarchy so that it might incorporate some of those republican elements. And in particular, uh, I'll try to work this out particularly next time, that he wants a king who is more in touch with his people. That what struck him about the Roman Republic was the role of the ordinary people in the regime. Not a huge role, not a fully democratic role, but the fact that the Republic engaged the people, the ordinary people of Rome, I think impressed him. And I think his understanding of Henry V was that maybe uh, an English king, uh, without <laughs> trying to establish a Republic and put himself out of business, might recover something of that mixed regime element of the Roman Republic, uh, where there'd be some popular element in the regime and also more room for the, uh, for, for the nobles. Uh, so just to you know, show that Shakespeare is still interested in Rome, he really does build an interest in Rome into the play. If you turn to page 48, uh, uh, which would be uh, act three, scene two, uh, uh, we have this comic Welshman, Fluellen, uh, who keeps referring to Rome, especially with regard to military matters. This would be about line 73. Uh, uh, he's upset with another soldier and says he has no more directions in the true disciplines of the wars, look you, of the Roman disciplines than is a puppy dog. Uh, and then up at the top of page 49, so about line 80 in the scene, uh, by Jesu, by Jesus, he, he will maintain his argument as well as any military man in the world in the disciplines of the pristine wars of the Romans. Uh, now, this is a concrete reflection of what we mean when we speak of the Renaissance. We call this period the Renaissance, rebirth, rebirth of what? The rebirth of classical antiquity. And of course, that means digging up these statues from ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, it means the rediscovery of Homer in Western Europe, uh, all these cultural aspects. Uh, but it also meant uh, an attempt to revive Roman military principles. That's very strong in Machiavelli's discourses uh, that uh, these Renaissance figures seriously wanted to study ancient histories, uh, people like Livy, uh, in order to learn how the Romans had been so successful in war. So Shakespeare creates this comic figure, this pedantic Welshman who, who studies uh, Roman warfare and complains uh, when the British don't live up to it. Uh, page 75 uh, is another example. <laughs> this is Act 4, Scene 1, about line 68. 
if you would take the pains but to examine the wars of Pompey the Great, you shall find, I warrant you, that there is no tittle-tattle nor pibble-pabble in Pompey's camp. Now again, we, we know Pompey the Great uh, from Julius Caesar, which Shakespeare was just about to write. Uh, and uh, I want you to see that in, within the texture of the play, the characters themselves are making reference to Roman history and see it as the way to guide them. Now, if you go back to page 49, there's an interesting little touch there. Again, that passage at the top of 49, so Act 3, Scene 2, uh, uh, line 80. Uh, the disciplines of the pristine wars of the Romans. Now, I happen to be studying uh, George Chapman's translation of the Iliad. Uh, George Chapman was a fellow dramatist of Shakespeare's, uh, but also was most famous for having translated the Iliad into English. And I was struck reading the preface to that, that Chapman writes of the ancient stratagems and disciplines of war. And Pompey, uh, uh, excuse me, Fulano speaks of the disciplines of the pristine wars uh, of the Romans. That may be an echo uh, of the preface to Chapman's uh, Iliad. Now I mentioned that because it fits in with what I was saying about the Earl of Essex last time. Again, a number of these poets uh, were part of the Essex faction to the extent that he was a great patron of literature. Uh, I was very involved in literary movements, as was his sidekick, the Earl of Southampton. And Chapman's translation of the Iliad was originally dedicated to the Earl of Essex. Uh, now, he started bringing out this translation in the 1590s. As I told you, by 1601, Essex was executed for treason. And <laughs> that's when you go and rewrite the old dedication to your Iliad, uh, and you no longer dedicate it to the disgraced Earl of Essex. And maybe, I forget if he then dedicated it to Queen Elizabeth or something. Uh, but again, it shows you how this other prominent poet and playwright of the time uh, was involved uh, with Essex. And I also mention that this is, this is really interesting uh, because uh, this was a major event in literature. Uh, again, for uh, in the late Middle Ages, people knew the Aeneid. Dante's Divine Comedy incorporates Virgil. People did not know Homer uh, in the Latin West uh, during the Middle Ages. Homer was known in Constantinople. When Constantinople and four, fell in 1433, 53 to the Turks, a lot of the Greek scholars went to Florence and other places in Italy and brought manuscripts uh, of Homer along with them. Homer was only rediscovered in Western Europe because of the fall uh, of Byzantium. And it was a major event when someone set out to translate, as it turned out to be, the whole of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, into uh, English. Uh, some of you may know John Keats's sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer, which is a late, you know, a romantic reflection of the importance of the event. I do want you to see that the translation of Homer into English was directly associated with the Earl of Essex, uh, that the man who did it, George Chapman, dedicated it uh, to Essex. And some people have argued that the translation of the Iliad was a was a propagandistic act of the war party in England. Now, that's a bit much to say, but it is interesting that, that at this moment when I've been telling you there, there were people in England who were trying to pursue uh, a relatively peaceful coexistence with the Spanish Empire, people like Lord Burley. There were these other people like Essex who wanted a more aggressive foreign policy. Uh, some critics have argued, well, the publication of the Iliad uh, in English was a celebration of warfare, the great warrior Achilles, and uh, some close studies have suggested, for example, this was the one that was most persuasive to me, is a study by uh, uh, someone who showed that uh, uh, the initial trans, uh, uh, Chapman originally published just a few books of the Iliad in translation, and then re redid them when he came out with a whole book. And it does look as if he changed some passages that seem to be referring to the Earl of Essex and especially his expedition against Cadiz. Uh, uh, that just the change of the language seemed to be an attempt to tone down the militarism of the poem. Anyway, uh, uh, these things can't be proven one way or the other. But I do, th again, it's an example uh, of how 
uh, some of the literature at the time uh, may have been part and parcel of this Essex movement, this attempt to get England more aggressive in its treatment uh, of Spain. Uh, I, again, I mention uh, Chapman's translation of the Iliad, because that book by Reuben Brower I recommended to you, Hero and Saint, one thing that Brower does there is to show how the language of Chapman's translation affected Shakespeare in the late 1590s. Uh, that Chapman's cha uh, uh, task was to forge an idiom in English that could uh, translate the heroic idiom of Homer in Greek. Uh, and Brower does a very convincing example. I believe he does a bit of it. You can see this in his preface to your edition, uh, the signet edition of Coriolanus. Uh, here's an example uh, from Hamlet, the famous line, uh, the sledded Polacks on the ice. Uh, uh, that phrase, sledded Polacks, uh, uh, sounds like a Homeric epithet. Uh, if you know uh, swift-footed Achilles, the sledded Polacks. Uh, and and uh, 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 Brower makes, I think, a convincing argument that Shakespeare, in trying to find a heroic idiom for his own plays, very much drew upon Chapman's translation of the Iliad. That's a very interesting literary point, but it also suggests there's something larger going on here, which is reflected in the epic texture of Henry V, something very unusual in Shakespeare. So turn to page three, uh, the prologue, the very opening of the play, oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. That, if you're into epics, uh, that's an invocation of the muse. That's the way Homer begins the Iliad and the Odyssey, sing muse, it's the way Virgil begins uh, the Aeneid. Uh, uh, this chorus, is unusual. You don't see this often in Shakespeare. I think Pericles may be the only other play uh, which has a full act-by-act -act chorus this way. And people have argued that this was an attempt to write a Henriad. Uh, that this play was an attempt uh, to create an epic treatment of an English king, and hence begin with an invocation uh, of abuse. Uh, and that's interesting. It may, uh, 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 again, I, there are signs that Shakespeare always found the uh, dramatic medium insufficient. Again, in, in his day, plays had about the status that television shows have now. Uh, they, it was not very prestigious to, to write plays. And there are signs he was trying to write more conventional poetry. Uh, with Venus and Adonis and Rape of Lucrece, he may have at this point realized, no, this is the greatest medium I could have, and try to adapt uh, plays to the epic. Now, again, at this point, uh, as it had been in antiquity, uh, the highest aspiration of a poet was to write an epic. Uh, Edmund Spencer had done it with his Fairy Queen in the 1580s and 90s. John Milton was to do it uh, 50 years later uh, with Paradise Lost. Uh, if you wanted to be a great poet with a lasting reputation at this point, your highest aspiration was to write an epic. I think it's possible that Shakespeare, who I believe was ambitious and knew how good he was, uh, may have decided, well, I can create epic theater. And so these, uh, there's a lot of epic language in this play, uh, uh, an attempt to present an English king uh, on an e epic model. Uh, and again, that's why some people have referred to this as the Henriad, uh, as if it were modeled on the, on the Iliad. Uh, this is the, you know, in some ways it's the fundamental question about the play that's been devoted, debated by critics over the centuries. This does seem to be Shakespeare's effort to present his image of a good king. Uh, he found the best material to work with. Uh, he was limited by the, uh, uh, the, the list of English kings he had available. And if you looked at it, Henry V looked pretty good. Uh, he, uh, he was uh, well respected as a monarch. And he had achieved this great thing of winning the Battle of Agincourt, uh, of uh, winning lands for England and France. Uh, and so I think, you know, Shakespeare took inventory here. Uh, 
couldn't turn Richard II into a great king, couldn't turn Richard III into a great king. Uh, so I, uh, uh, I, I think this is his effort to show about as good a king as you could reasonably be, expect. And this uh, Henry V is still revered in England, and uh, uh, when you see the Olivier, Laurence Olivier version, the film version, that was made as a patriotic gesture during World War II to offer an image of uh, uh, British greatness in the midst of its great struggle uh, against Nazi Germany. Uh, you will, however, notice, if you watch the Olivier film, he had to admit an off, omit an awful lot of the play to come forward with this image uh, of Henry as good. And indeed, the Branagh film, when it was, came out, uh, was looked upon as a revisionist uh, staging of the work, and indeed, uh, starting in the particularly the 1970s and 80s, uh, critics began to notice some very dubious things that Henry does. We'll talk about this particularly next time with regard to the killing of the French prisoners. Uh, but I, I'll, you know, I've already shown you how he makes a kind of behind uh, 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 the scenes deal with the Catholic Church. We'll be looking more at that. And there was a swing in criticism uh, to suggest that, in fact, this is a portrait of an evil king, a very Machiavellian king. Now, what I'll say is it was very hard for some people to understand that maybe Shakespeare was showing Machiavellian aspects to Henry's rule and still regarded him as a good king, or in fact saw that as precisely why he was a good king. And let's remember that the phrase good king uh, is deeply ambiguous. When we hear good in these contexts, we tend to think morally good. But remember there's that other sense of good which is efficient, which means efficient, which means a king who gets the job done, and you may not be able to be always morally good uh, and get the job done as a king. And I think ultimately the complexity of the portrait of Henry comes from the fact that Shakespeare is trying to show us what a good king would be like with the understanding that sometimes a good king will have to do evil things. Again, we'll try to look at that in some detail, but I want you to think about that as you think about uh, uh, Henry, that uh, there, there may be a sense here, again, that politics often demands uh, things that uh, ordinary life doesn't. And again, it's why I think Shakespeare thinks of uh, uh, ordinary, uh, political life as tragic, even in the case of a successful uh, a, a king as Henry. So, let's go back to where we were last time. Really, this startling opening scene, uh, when we see what I can only describe as a fully politicized Catholic Church making a deal with the reigning monarch of England. Now, from the start, we see uh, problems that the Roman regime did not face. And I think, uh, again, it's a little artificial the way we're doing this because we're starting with this play. And really, we should have backed up three plays and started with Richard II. But it makes a nice point that you can see as we make our jump from Roman to British politics that there's an extremely important new player on the scene. Uh, that the, the, Ro the Roman Republic and the, the, the uh, Roman uh, emperors in Antony's day did not have to deal with, and that is the Catholic Church as a political institution. Uh, what we see here is how powerful it was. Uh, it has all this land, all this wealth. The suggestion is it has enough wealth to maintain its own army, which in effect it did. Uh, the, uh, uh, the papal states in Italy at this time had their own armies. Uh, uh, and, of course, it has a great deal of prestige. So much prestige that Henry is trying to use it. Uh, he's trying to get the backing of the church for his uh, war against France. Uh, and so there's another player in the political world here. Uh, uh, not quite part of England, a church ruled from Rome, a church that has its own political structure, that has bishops, 
and archbishops and also cardinals. Uh, uh, you know, a wonderful emblem of what I'm talking about and what Shakespeare would have had in mind. How many of you have been to Hampton Court Palace outside of London? Anybody? I mean, they had events at the Olympics there. The cycling races ended up there. Uh, that was one of Henry VIII's great palace. But it was built by Cardinal Wolsey. It was built by a prince of the church. Uh, you know, arguably the second most powerful man uh, in England uh, in the early days of Henry VIII. And uh, Henry didn't like that, that Cardinal Wolsey built a better palace than Henry had. And in fact, Cardinal Wolsey fell into disgrace uh, and uh, when Henry had him executed, one of the things that Henry did was take the palace. But it's a good image for what I'm talking about, that a Catholic cardinal built this huge palace and probably to show off that he was as powerful as Henry VIII. And of course, Henry VIII went on to break with the Catholic Church and establish what we now call the Anglican Church. Uh, that is, a, in the um, preceding plays in this second tetralogy, especially in the Henry IV plays, uh, bishops had led revolts against Henry IV. Uh, the Catholic Church is an active player in British politics as Shakespeare uh, sees it. So one of the things, we're, if we're talking about Henry as an effective king, one of the things Shakespeare shows us from the beginning is you've got to get the Catholic Church in line. Now again, Henry VIII eventually did that by essentially abolishing it and creating a national church uh, in England uh, of which he was the supreme head with the right to appoint the Archbishop of Canterbury. The time this play takes place, the Pope appoints uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he, you know, uh, uh, Shakespeare is bound by history. He can't have Henry V start the Reformation in 1415. Uh, but he comes awfully close to doing what Henry did. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, Henry has a problem here. He wants a war in France. But he doesn't want to appear to be the one who started it. And he doesn't want to, be, uh, to appear not to have any rights in France. So the great challenge here uh, is that uh, he needs the church to give him backing for the war he wants in France. Now, this is on page 9. Uh, 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 so Act 1, Scene 2, uh, where the king says around line 5, uh, we would be resolved before we hear of some things of weight that task our thoughts concerning us in France. And then in comes Can Canterbury, and, and uh, Henry says, line 10, My lord, lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law salique that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim, and God forbid my dear and faithful Lord, that you should fashion rest or bow, bow your reading uh, or nicely charge your understanding soul with opening titles miscreant. You know, we know this is a sham. We know he's made a deal with the Catholic Church. Uh, we'll take everything you've got unless you're willing to give us backing uh, to attack France and to contribute money to it, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, and look, continuing on page 10, about line 18. For God doth know how many now in hell shall drop, your blood in ap drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. You know, you're inciting us to it. This isn't my idea. I'm just standing here. Let me know. Do I have a claim to the French throne or not? Oh, and don't be, just tell me the honest truth here. Uh, uh, therefore, take heed how you upon our person, uh, how you awake our sleeping soul of war. We charge you in the name of God, take heed, for never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood, and so on. And, uh, and that what you speak is in your conscious wash as pure as sin with baptism. Now, what, go, what happens here now uh, is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this churchman is going to argue that the Salic law does not apply in France. This would be like someone saying the U.S. Constitution does not apply in the United States. That is, this is the, the issue here is that, you know, in England, women can inherit the throne. 
as we well know uh, to this day. <coughs> in France, women could not inherit the throne. That's the Salic law. Uh, and Henry's claim to the French throne is going to come through a female line. So he must abrogate the Salic law to have any claim to the French throne. And so uh, you need someone who can interpret texts. Uh, and no Harvard professors being available at the time, you go to the church, because they were the only people who could read then. And so he gives this long speech, uh, 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 say on page 11, Act 1, Scene 2, about line 54, uh, that it doth well appear, the Salic law was not devised for the realm of France. I mean, again, the United States Constitution was not devised for the United States. I mean, this law by which the French have ruled themselves for centuries, we're now told, it really applied somewhere in Germany. Uh, uh, and now this speech is very long and very confusing, and I believe deliberately so. Uh, uh, Olivier doesn't know what to do with it. He turns it into pure comedy. Uh, the archbishop has all these documents and he drops them. And, uh, uh, but there is a kind of comedy here. Uh, uh, the, the aim here is to show that Henry has rights in France. Uh, now, that's not entirely implausible, by the way, if you remember 1066, the Norman Conquest. The ruling families of Britain at this time were of French descent. In 1016, 1066, people from France, from Normandy, conquer England. Uh, and the English court uh, spoke French for many centuries, was bilingual. In Chaucer's, Chaucer wrote poetry in French because Rich, Richard II, who was a Plantagenet, or a Plantagenet, uh, as we say in French. Uh, Richard's court is heavily French. Uh, 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 so, I mean, Henry V uh, is descended from people who originally came from France. Uh, and uh, the whole point here is that sort of everybody has a claim uh, if, you, if you go back far enough. But if you look at, on page 11, I'll just call your attention to some moments in this great derivation of Henry's uh, right to rule France. Line 65, which deposed Childeric. Line 69, who usurped the crown of Charles, the Duke of Lorraine. And line, line 78, heir to the usurped Capet, what you see, then find, yeah, page 12, line 95, uh, usurped from you and your progenitors. I mean, what you see is if you check any royal pedigree, there's something wrong with it. There's usurpers all the way down. Uh, and so that, that line at the top of page 12, line 85, so that as clear as is the summer sun. Henry's title to France is as clear as is the summer sun. Give me a break. Uh, I mean, you give this speech and it turns out there's at least three breaks in the line uh, here, at least three usurpers. And of course, the deepest irony is Henry's claim to the English throne ain't so good either. Here he is claiming the right to the French throne uh, and there are people who challenge his right to the English throne. Now, again, genealogy is not my fort, uh, and this is very complicated. But basically, Richard II was the grandson of the preceding king because the son, Edward the Black Prince, was killed in France. Uh, 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 Henry IV was the grandnephew of the preceding king. I think it was some Edward, but I've forgotten which Edward. But anyway, uh, Richard II was the grandson of the preceding monarch. He was deposed uh, by Henry Bolingbroke, who was the grandnephew. So uh, the, the, the so-called Lancaster line, the line that goes from John of Gaunt uh, to Henry Bolingbroke, Henry IV, to uh, Prince Hal, Henry V, uh, the, they were, you know, they're, they're cousins of Richard II. Uh, uh, so, and there were other relatives, descendants of Edward whatever, uh, and uh, uh, they had claims to the throne too. Uh, if I'm confusing you, that's fine, because the point is it is confused. Uh, uh, Bolingbroke usurped the throne. Henry V is the son of a usurper. 
That means his claim to the throne is a little weak to begin with. And there's a lot of other people floating around that ha- are, you know, in the line of succession. Edward whatever, uh, <laughs> Edward III was it? I think. Anyway, had like five or six sons. And anyway, everyone's de- had a lot of descendants. So here's Hen- Henry V with a somewhat dubious claim. People have rebelled against him in the preceding play. Uh, as we see, there's a conspiracy against him in Act Two. Uh, he does not have a secure claim to the English throne, and here he is now claiming uh, 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 that he's got a right uh, to the uh, French th- throne. Uh, but the two things go together because what we see here is that Henry's plan, uh, and this would be a Machiavellian plan, uh, is to secure his rule in England by uniting everybody behind a war with France. It's, again, that Roman strategy of using foreign policy to solve your domestic problems. But Henry is particularly careful uh, to give a good cover to this operation. So page 12, line 96, uh, may I with right and conscience make this claim? Again, again, we know how phony this scene is. It's all been arranged behind the scenes. And then Henry gets what he wants from the Archbishop of Canterbury. The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. And then he goes on again, quoting the Bible and so on. But we're going to see that this is Henry's uh, ultimate Machiavellian strategy, uh, never to present himself uh, as the one responsible for what he does. And, you know, that's, that's dearly what he wants to hear, the sin upon my head, dread sovereign. In fact, he's setting up the Archbishop of Canterbury for a fall. Things go wrong. We're going to blame the Archbishop of Canterbury. I never had any particular interest in invading France. I just opened it up as a question, should I invade France or should I not? And the church told me I should do it. Uh, again, this is a political strategy we can recognize a lot in the world today. Uh, and then you see the consequences on page 13. Uh, so still Act 1, scene 2, about line 26, 126. Never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here uh, in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Uh, this is, in fact, the underlying motive of the campaign to get the nobles behind uh, his kingship in a foreign campaign. Remember, Bolingbroke, Henry IV, Henry V's father, was just one of many nobles who got screwed by Richard II and banished and then led a rebellion of nobles to depose Richard II and execute him. that gave other nobles a lot of ideas. <laughs> if Bolingbroke could do it, why can't we do it? Uh, and uh, uh, they cooperated with him to depose her to the second. Uh, but then what Shakespeare shows in the Henry IV plays is some of the nobles get dissatisfied. Uh, they're not getting enough uh, out of this new situation. And you, uh, Henry, the two Henry IV plays are about various great nobles uh, uh, who rebel against uh, 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 Henry IV. And Henry V's idea is, if I can get them to unite in a battle against France, they'll support me. And of course, the, the church then comes through, uh, uh, line 132, in aid whereof we of the spirituality will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never did the clergy at one time bring in to any of your ancestors. The, the church will bankro- uh, bankroll the war. Remember, they're under the threat of losing everything, all their wealth, all their land, and so instead they've made this deal that they'll come through uh, with, with some uh, money for the war. Now, just I'll come back to this, but we see one of the problems uh, is... Uh, you can't go to war with France until you've secured your northern borders because these Scots are always rebelling or fighting with the English. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that uh, in a little while. But uh, the uh, uh, Henry's strategy here is to get the church behind him, get the nobles behind him, uh, get the people behind him uh, in a war against 
the French. Uh, give people a common enemy. We saw that function uh, in the uh, Roman Republic. Uh, uh, and uh, as if that weren't enough, uh, the French blunder here, uh, the Dauphin, uh, uh, the, the heir to the French throne, uh, insults Henry. Uh, Henry did have a reputation for being a wild man in his youth, and so the dolphin sends him these tennis balls uh, to uh, insult him, and now he's got even more of a reason uh, to uh, uh, attack France, and so we hear uh, uh, page 18, dot line 282, uh, and tell the pleasant prince this mock of his hath turned his balls to gunstones, and his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this is mock, mock out of their dear husbands. So first, Archbishop of Canterbury is going to be responsible for the war. Now the French Dauphin is responsible for the war. This is very clever on Henry's part. Uh, he, he's always trying to evade uh, blame. So uh, we begin to see in the first act what an effective monarch would have to do. And in particular, the challenge here is to solve the problem of a feudal monarchy, where in the high Middle Ages, the king shared power, shared power with the other nobles, shared power with the Catholic Church. We see here in the emergence of a more modern monarch, what we would call a central monarch. Uh, this happened in effect you know, during the 16th century in England, it happened in the 16th century in France, that the challenge to these kings uh, was to get the church in line uh, and to get the nobles in line. And we see uh, Henry V doing it here in ways that anticipate what's called the Tudor settlement, where Henry VIII actually did seize the, the Catholic church's land and use it to create a new aristocracy directly loyal to him. Okay, let me pause here. Any, any questions about that? Okay, uh, this play is pretty uh, linear in its organization. Let's, let's move on to the second act. Uh, uh, and here we uh, see, again, the problem of getting uh, the domestic world in order uh, before you go to fight uh, uh, a foreign enemy, and uh, you get a sense of what Henry's strategy is. Uh, uh, we see, we keep getting glimpses in this play of the ordinary people uh, in England. I should say that many of these characters are carryovers from the two plays, Henry IV, Part One and Two. And again, I wish we'd read them, but we can't do everything. Uh, but if you turn to page 25, uh, uh, the, uh, so this is Act 2, Scene 1, about line 92. Uh, Barnolf says, Come, shall I make you two friends? We must to France together. Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? That is the heart of Henry's strategy here. Uh, you've got a divided England. Uh, we see it on many levels. Uh, here, just among the common people, uh, they're... Their thumos is always boiling over. They're, they're quarreling with each other. Uh, they quarrel over women. They quarrel over money. They just quarrel over quarrels. Uh, but why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throat when we got French enemies? This is picked up uh, later in the play on page 80. More explicitly, uh, uh, this is Act 4, Scene 1. Outline 228, be friends, you English fools, be friends. We have French quarrels enough if you could tell how to wreck it. That's in a way everything Henry does is to produce that statement. Uh, to create unity among the English by reminding them that they've got to unite against the uh, French enemies. Now, we, again, we're reading the plays out of chronological order, but we saw that lesson with the Romans and the Volskis. Uh, we saw the other side of it in Anne Cleopatra, that when Rome ran out of foreign enemies, domestic broils began to break out 
This is, again, a very Machiavellian point about the relation of foreign and domestic policy, and Shakespeare is very aware of. And it does seem to be uh, the hope here that to pursue these imperial projects in order to unite the English nation behind, be, behind uh, Henry. Now, what, what surfaces among the common people here at the beginning of Act Two, then is revealed to be going on among the nobles, and that's more serious. Uh, uh, the, uh, that is, it turns out uh, that there's a conspiracy among the nobles uh, between Cambridge, Gray, and Scroop uh, to overthrow the king. Uh, and uh, uh, Henry's got a plan to deal with that. And again, it's very characteristic of him. It begins with an act of clemency on his part. This is on page 29. So act two, scene two. Uh, there's a sort of nameless guy who's been accused of treason. Uh, and Henry, for no apparent reason, around line 40, says, free, enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excessive wine that set him on. And on his more advice, we pardon him. Uh, we don't even know who this man is. We just know he's said some things against the king. It's actually an interesting touch that Henry offers here the excuse he was drunk. Uh, again, I'll have to fill in some background here for you. In the Henry IV plays, the young Henry V, called Prince Hal, spends a lot of time in bars, spends a lot of time <laughs> drinking. Uh, uh, and And... Shakespeare's overall suggestion seems to be that it's very useful for Henry to go out among his people and learn what their lives are, and, and for example, to learn to appreciate the fact that they get drunk and do some pretty stupid things when they do, and you see that this is a useful lesson for a king to have here, that he realizes this wasn't a true conspiracy. It's really not a problem, so we can let him go free. But actually, there's something much deeper going on here that you see in line... 44, when Scroop says that's mercy, but too much security, let him be punished sovereign, less example breed by his su sufferings more of such a fool. Oh, let us be yet be merciful. And came so may your highness and yet punish too. And grace, so you show great mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. So these guys, these nobles start arguing, you're being too merciful, you can't be lenient, you're setting a bad example. And then he springs the trap on them. You guys are in a conspiracy against me. Uh, uh, he's got the goods on them. Uh, this is on page 30. Uh, and they, <laughs> uh, this great moment, line 76, when Cambridge says, I do confess my fault and do submit me to your highness's mercy. And then Gray and Scroop says, to which we all appeal. And the king says, the mercy that was quick in us but late by your own counsel is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy for your own reasons turn to your bosom. And then we realize this whole thing was staged. The act of mercy to the nameless man uh, was precisely designed to elicit from these conspiring nobles an attack on mercy and to say the king can't afford to give mercy to traitorous people. And now he sprung the trap uh, and again, it's that same strategy. You know, I'm a merciful guy, but you're the guys who argued against mercy. Uh, you condemned yourselves. I didn't condemn you. You know, I was letting this guy free. I would have let you go free until you convinced me uh, that I can't be merciful uh, as a king. And these are the touches that, you know, it, it, it's, it's one thing, you're a king, and there's a conspiracy against you, and so you deal with it. But what Shakespeare shows is something much more subtle, and we would say Machiavellian, in how Henry operates here, that he is not content just to condemn these guys. He wants them to condemn themselves. That's really, you know, again, you begin to see what a smart guy this Henry is uh, and how he learns uh, to deal with precisely the problem uh, again and again of, of, of the insecurity of his throne the insecurity of his claim uh, to the throne uh, here. Uh, any questions about that? Yes? Yeah. 
You know, it's, a, uh, uh, it's an interesting question. You'd have to go into all the details of the different situation of the Catholic Church in England uh, and the Catholic Church in France. I'll just say this, that, that uh, although Shakespeare presents uh, the Catholic Church as what would be called a fifth column within England, that is an institution that has a foreign loyalty, these still are Englishmen. And so, uh, you know, they're, they're not all at the disposed to make a deal with the French uh, here. So uh, again, uh, they, the, 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 the churchmen themselves have divided loyalties. Uh, and, you know, it is a tough call uh, here. Henry made them an offer they couldn't refuse. It's a pretty, you know, he basically said, I'm going to take away everything. Uh, but if you'll offer me support for my war in France and give me some money, you're okay. Now that, you know, it's reasonable to accept that deal. Uh, uh, now, you know, just in support of what you say, during Shakespeare's time, uh, during the second half of the 16th century, uh, the Catholics in England were making deals with the French and the Spanish and the papacy to try to overthrow the Protestant monarchy in England. So uh, I'm going to call yours the nuclear option. It was called into play once Henry VIII broke openly with the Catholic Church and made England Protestant. Then the remnants of the Catholic Church in England really did start conspiring with foreign powers and there were all sorts of treason trials about that. The famous gunpowder plot uh, uh, was a plan to blow up the parliament under James I. So, so it's not as if what you're suggesting didn't in fact happen. What I'm saying is that uh, it, this wasn't the moment for it. The Catholic Church didn't feel that threatened by Henry. We can still deal with a guy, okay? Yeah. But as you say, the nuclear option was, uh, was used uh, unsuccessfully uh, in the, the 1590s, well, the whole second half of the 16th century. Uh, uh, okay, let's, I'm going to come back to some of the stuff in the first two acts, but let's turn to Act uh, uh, 3. Uh, uh, as we, st we now see... Uh, Henry at, at war. And what's very interesting to see is how carefully controlled uh, he is in war. If you turn to page 44, uh, this is Act 3, Scene 1. Uh, one of these many famous battlefield speeches Shakespeare gives to Henry. Rhetoric has returned here, uh, not because it's a republic, but because we have armies that need to be inspired. So, famous speech that begins... Uh, Act 3, Scene 1, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility, but when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood. Now here is the problematic relation of war and peace that we've been seeing a lot uh, in this course and as some how fundamental to Shakespearean tragedy here. Henry understands you don't behave the same way in peacetime as you do in wartime. Uh, uh, Coriolanus didn't understand that and got into a lot of problems. And notice it is, let's say, a kind of Christian pagan split. In peace, there's nothing some becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. There are the Christian virtues we saw merging in the late Roman Empire uh, and that uh, are identified with uh, uh, being nice, being passive, not being aggressive, turning the other cheek. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger, uh, uh, become a Homeric hero. Uh, Henry understands that... Uh, you need to be moderate and, 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 even, and even calm and, and uh, unaggressive in peacetime, but in wartime, you've got to be really nasty and brutish uh, and aggressive. Now, that's very difficult. It's, in fact, in some ways, the most common problem of Shakespeare's tragic heroes, that they're great warriors, but can't handle things in peacetime. So it all goes back, if you know Richard III, it begins <coughs> with a soliloquy where Richard III laments the fact that peace has broken out. <coughs> and he's great in wartime, 
But in peacetime, he has to go to uh, parties and be a social animal and being a hunchback, he doesn't fit in well. Uh, uh, the famous, uh, the, uh, now is the winter of our discontent soliloquy. Uh, we saw it in Coriolanus, some ways you see it in Mark Antony. We're going to see it in Othello, we're going to see it in Macbeth. Shakespeare understands that the things that make you a great warrior uh, do not necessarily make you succeed very well in peacetime politics. The history of the United States uh, uh, is peppered with examples of people that established their reputations in war uh, and maybe didn't do so well in peacetime politics. I think if Shakespeare were alive in the 20th century, uh, and were writing tragedies, very likely he would have written about Douglas MacArthur or George Patton. And I'll say that the most Shakespearean, non-Shakespearean movie I know is the movie Patton uh, with George C. Scott, uh, which is in a way the tragedy of a man who flourishes on the battlefield and can't adopt, uh, adapt to, to peaceful circumstances. And the thing that is going to be unusual about Henry V that Shakespeare shows, uh, he, he, he's almost the exception that proves the rule. Here's a man who's very conscious of the difference between war and peace and how you have to behave differently in war and peace uh, and, and has the ability to shift gears uh, in a way that uh, a uh, uh, Coriolanus cannot. The other thing, speaking of Coriolanus, uh, the other thing that you see here this is on page 45, line 29 to 30. Look at his rhetoric with the soldiers. For there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. Coriolanus would be incapable of saying that. He can, uh, he can inspire troops. Uh, he can lead them into battle, though most of the time it's by shame by saying, calling them slaves and calling them geese and trying to shame them into fighting. But this, in a way, is going to be Henry's strategy here. Uh, and you notice, I mean, in a weird way, it is a Christian war rhetoric that the base could be noble. He is going to appeal to the common soldiers by acknowledging that they will get a certain nobility if they will fight bravely for him. Uh, again, Coriolanus can inspire troops, but he never goes so far as to call the plebeians noble uh, if they follow him in, into war. So this guy is uh, more impressive in terms of rhetoric than Coriolanus and more, more adaptable. Now, if you'll just flip from 44 to 46, Act, scene one, Act 3, Scene 1 to Act 3, Scene 2, Act 3, Scene 1 begins once more unto the breach, dear friends, uh, once more. You'll notice that uh, the scene two begins uh, on, 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 on to the breach, to the breach. Uh, this is a technique that Shakespeare developed in the Henry IV plays and continues uh, here. That is, there's a, a, a constant effort to juxtapose uh, scenes among the king and the aristocrats with scenes among the common people. Often, as here, the distinction is made uh, by contrasting verse with prose. Henry speaks in classic Shakespeare and iambic pentameter in scene one. The characters speak in, 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 in prose. Uh, there often is a kind of social inflection to the distinction between verse and prose in Shakespeare. And it sets up a very complex uh, dialectic here. Uh, in, uh, again, this is clearer in the Henry IV plays, but you can see it here. In some ways, these are scenes of contrast. In some ways, they're scenes of identification. Uh, that is, by the mere fact that the nobles speak in poetry and the common people speak in prose, you have some sense that the nobles are noble and the common people are common. Uh, and one thing you do see among the common people here is cowardice. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is much clearer when you see it staged. It's done very clearly, I think, in both films, definitely in the Branagh film. Uh, that is, you see, you know, uh, let me put it this way, yeah. Uh, in the first scene, you see the officer's view of war. In the second scene, you see the enlisted man's view of war. 
Henry makes war seem so noble and poetic. It's a matter for great speeches. And here we see the people who actually have to do the fighting and who are scared. <laughs> you know, Bardolph is trying to rally them, uh, as Henry was, you know, to the breach. You know, when you, when you breach the walls of a city, that's when you rush in. Remember Coriolanus in Corioli. But here, line three on page 46, pray thee, corporal, stay, the knocks are too hot. And for mine own part, I have not a case of lives. Uh, and then the boy, uh, uh, this is line 11, boy, again, who's played by a very, very young Christian Bale in the Brano film. Uh, would, I, uh, would I were in an alehouse in London, I would give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. See, that's the opposite of the heroic ethic right there. Uh, remember, for these nobles, they're willing to give up life for fame. Uh, here's someone willing to give up fame uh, for a pot of ale and safety. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's this, there, there is this strong sense of contrast, uh, the difference between the noble and the common people. On the other hand, there is a kind of, you know, with that echo there of to the breach, uh, there is a sense these, this is the same event being seen from two different angles. This is, you know, very modern, uh, the stagecraft here. This really is a very powerful, we would almost say a cinematic cut here from the high view of war to the low view of war. Uh, and uh, uh, Shakespeare is trying to suggest to us, I think, that, yeah, uh, war from one angle looks very noble, from another angle it looks crazy. Uh, these people are foolhardy, they're just getting themselves killed. Uh, and there's a lot of, uh, one thing you'll see, uh, you see among these common people, they're thieves. To the extent they're in it, they want to loot. Uh, and again, you seem to have this contrast, oh, these nobles who are fighting for England and doing these great things, and then these common people that just want to loot. But there's another sense in which Shakespeare identifies the two. What is Henry doing but looting France? Uh, and again, I think this is the complexity of Shakespeare that he can give you two perspectives on the same action uh, here that from one point of view we're reminded, yeah, these nobles are noble. They really have high-minded things in mind. On the other hand, there's this underlying sense, you know, the, is this really better? Is this really more noble? Aren't they all just in it for what they can get out of it? And again, there's no simple answer to that, but I think Shakespeare is trying to work out uh, uh, that question here. Now, we then get a scene, uh, continuing with the scene, we get an Irishman, a Scotsman, and a Welshman. And, you know, sounds like time for a great joke. You know, an Irishman, a Scotsman, and a Welshman go on a hiking trip. And, uh, and it is part of Shakespeare's joke here. Uh, but again, it's a very interesting dimension to the play. Uh, and that is to raise the issue here of Great Britain, or what we now call the United Kingdom. Uh, that is, uh, we see, you know, we seem to be dealing with England versus France. But now we see that England, the English side, consists of Irish, Welsh, and the Scottish as well. Uh, and in a sense, you see the emergence of the hope for what's now called the United Kingdom. Uh, and this is very real in Shakespeare's day. This is another uh, way in which the play reflects very contemporary uh, interest for Shakespeare. Uh, uh, in Shakespeare's day, there was, uh, Scotland was independent of England. Uh, uh, it was only when Elizabeth died and her relative James VI of Scotland came to the British throne as James I of England that Scotland and England began to be united. Wales had been absorbed into England because the Tudor family was Welsh. Uh, Henry Richmond, who became Henry VII, and therefore was the grandfather of Queen Elizabeth, uh, he'd incorporated Wales into England by virtue of coming from a Welsh family. Ireland is Ireland. <laughs> I mean, as we've already seen, uh, England was not incorporating Ireland at this point in 1600, certainly not in 1415. 
But what you see, and you know, <laughs> we have someone from Scotland in this class. Is she here today? Uh, <laughs> she can confirm that, you know, there's a lot of people in Scotland that don't want to be part of the United Kingdom. They're going to have a referendum pretty soon. It's kind of amazing when you think about it. Uh, the dream of the United Kingdom is the Irish, the Welsh, the Scottish, and the English should live together under one monarchy. Well, Wales is reasonably well incorporated uh, into to England, though the Welsh still maintain their own language and the BBC has to have Welsh language stations or the Welsh would take a walk. Ireland, forget about. You know, for, for the entire 19th century, the whole of Ireland was part of England. I think the Act of Union was 1798. By 1921, uh, more than two-thirds of the island of Ireland had broken off. And the Scottish, there's this term devolution in England. They want more and more power, autonomy to be returned to Scotland. I mean, what I'm saying is, if it's this way today, imagine the way it was in Shakespeare's day or the way it was in Henry V's day. So uh, Shakespeare, you know, he doesn't, doesn't have to bring an Irishman, a Welshman, and a, a Scotsman into the play here. Uh, Again, it's one of the ironies that this highlights. Uh, Henry V wants to incorporate France into England. He can't even incorporate Wales, Scotland, and Ireland into England. Uh, I mean, I think this play offers a kind of imperial project here. And yet at the same time, and I'm not sure how to balance these out, it raises very serious issues about the potentiality of uh, uh, empire. I mean, again, the hope here is the only way you can unite the Irish, the Scottish, and the Welsh with the English is get them all to fight France. Uh, this would be the logic of the whole imperial project here. To form the United Kingdom, let's have France as the common enemy. Uh, and that's really, again, very fundamental to Henry's strategy here. And we'll see it further later on in the play, but, you know, Henry very consciously presents himself as a Welshman. Uh, and, keep, you know, was lecturing his troops, be nice to Flewellen. He's British just as we are. Uh, we need to have the Welsh, and, uh, and we need the Scottish, we need the Irish. Uh, uh, it, yeah, again, it's amazing that the, these distinctions have survived this long to this day, and who knows if the United Kingdom will stay united uh, at this. Uh, uh, so very interesting that Shakespeare brings up this, uh, the problem, what is my nation? Uh, you see that, uh, I, I think these are attempts to do accents here, page 50, line 124, what is my nation? I, uh, what is my nation? It's a real question, again, suffice to say, am I Irish or am I British? Uh, am I Scottish or am I English? Now, there's a strong suggestion here, uh, it seems to me, uh, that the English are particularly dependent on these ethnic minorities, we would say today, because they supply the punch to the army. And by that, I mean they are presented as more barbaric than the English, and therefore fiercer fighters. And I particularly mean the Irishmen. You know, again, if you know the history of uh, the British military, uh, uh, the Irish and the Scottish soldiers were always the best. Uh, uh, certainly the most effective. Uh, uh, Rudyard Kipling shows this in his stories set in India, that again and again the English triumphed by using Irish and Scottish soldiers. Uh, to be honest, a, this is, shows up in the American military history. Uh, uh, some incredible percentage of Medal of Honor winners come from Appalachia, from four states in Appalachia, and they're of Scotch-Irish descent. Uh, these are fierce people uh, and make good soldiers. And where do we see that? In McMorris, page 49. So act three, scene two. Uh, the greatest line in the whole play, line 94, I would have blowed up the town so Christ saved me. 
I've never seen anyone call attention to this line. But if you can understand this line, again, you can understand the whole problematic we're looking at for the rest of this course. I would have blowed up the town, so Christ saved me. There is the conflict between the pagan and the Christian I've been telling you about. Here's a man who is fierce and and who would have blowed up the town, and then he says, so Christ saved me. There is an internal contradiction in that sentence. I'll ask you to dwell as long as possible on the contradiction of saying, I would have blown up the town, so Christ saved me. Uh, and, and Shakespeare repeats this, uh, top of page 50. Uh, there is throats to be cut and works to be done, and there's nothing done, so Christ save me. Uh, 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 and then finally, uh, line 135, so Christ save me, I will cut off your head. <laughs> These are not particularly Christian <laughs> sentiments here. And Shakespeare packs them into one explosive sentence. Uh, now again, this is the whole problematic of the Renaissance. Uh, Europe was Christian. Uh, at the time of the Renaissance, and the hope is to revive classical antiquity. Classical antiquity was pagan. How do you revive paganism within a Christian civilization? The problem you get is people running around, I'll cut off your head so Christ save me. Uh, and the suggestion here is that this Irishman is a peculiarly fierce man who loves blowing up towns and cutting off people's heads, and that's a really good person to have on your side in a battle. Uh, the, <laughs> the problem is how compatible is that with Christian feelings? Uh, I, you know, again, the Shakespeare, these lines, just amazing. There's nobody even comes close uh, with stuff like this. Uh, and, and here it is. You, what, you see the way people can carry around contradictory values in their heads. Uh, I mean, the, you know, when I dwell on it, it's preposterous. <laughs> Cut off your head, so Christ save me. But you know, Shakespeare's right. Uh, this is an exaggerated example of this, but there's a lot of people uh, that go through life uh, embracing contradictory ethics. I mean, we, and not in a hypocritical way. It's like, McMorris, you know, doesn't understand that there's something unchristian about cutting off people's heads. I mean, if you asked him, are you a good Christian? Say, I'm an Irishman, of course, I'm a good Catholic. Uh, do you want to cut off someone's head? Yeah, sure, sure, that's what I'm here for. Uh, Shakespeare's aim in these plays is very philosophic because he's trying to uh, excavate these contradictions in people's values. Here we are at Hegel here. You know, what Hegel says, a tragedy is a conflict of two goods or two principles or two values. Here you see it. Here, here's a man who can go around saying he's a Christian and who can go around uh, uh, wanting to cut people's heads off and not understand there's any tension between that. Uh, uh, we're going to see how this happens much more seriously in Macbeth, for example. Uh, or in Othello, and in another way in Hamlet. And so Shakespeare is going to show us men who are Christians, but there's some pagan element in them as well, some disposition to war uh, as well. Or in Hamlet, we're going to see uh, the pagan attitude towards revenge clash with the Christian uh, attitude towards revenge. Shakespeare is very well aware that the Renaissance was setting up a tragedy, if you will by trying to revive pagan classical values within a Christian culture, it's offering you crazy moments like this. <laughs> I'll blow up the town so Christ save me. Uh, uh, now, what, what, what McMorris is not aware of, Shakespeare is very aware of. Uh, uh, and in, uh, indeed, he wants to make us aware of what uh, McMorris is not uh, aware of here. But very, again, very interesting scene here. I think it's omitted uh, in both movies. Uh, but again, if you dwell on this scene, you get a sense of how problematic the Renaissance world is for Shakespeare when you have people looking to Christianity but also looking to classical paganism uh, for their values. Uh, any question about that? Right, just keep those lines in your mind. Then quickly I'll see how much I can get done in Act 3 today. Uh, we then see Henry attack the town of Harfleur. Uh, 
uh, and we see a strategy. Uh, he comes to this town and he says, if you'll surrender, you'll be treated with mercy. But if you don't, we're going to raise your town to the ground. Uh, and indeed, page 51, about line three, therefore, to our best mercy, give yourselves. Uh, uh, and then notice what he says if they don't. <laughs> uh, line 10, the gates of mercy shall be all shut up and the flesh soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hands shall range, with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins and your flowering, inf flowering infants. What is it then to me if impious war, arrayed in flames, like to the prince of fiends, doth with his smirched complexion all fell feats and linked to waste and desolation, and desolation? What is it to me when you yourselves are cause? And there it is again. I'm not going to rape your people. You're going to rape them. You know, if you surrender, nothing happens. But if you don't surrender, the fault's on you. Uh, again, it's very consistent in his policy. And indeed, they surrender, and he says, use mercy to them all. Line 54, use mercy to them all. Uh, that is uh, one of the amazing aspects of Henry, that he, 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 he's e able to switch gears. He's able to turn on a dime. It's almost like you say, you know, how can you be this horrible man conjuring up images of raping and pillaging and then become merciful? Uh, uh, it's actually very difficult to do that uh, for Genghis Khan to turn into Jesus Christ uh, here. But, but Shakespeare is suggesting Henry can do that. This is a very unusual uh, person that he's offering him here, and I think it's why Henry is... Uh, an image of a kind of ideal uh, uh, monarch here. And indeed, uh, 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 Henry behaves himself. We're going to skip Act 3, Scene 4, because it's in French, and I don't know what it's about. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll probably end with discussing Act 3, uh, Scene 4. But if you'll turn to page uh, 62, you'll, you'll see that how decent Henry can be as a king. Uh, war, war is hell, it's very nasty. Shakespeare doesn't downplay that. But he's trying to show someone who evidently does not enjoy war. He's good at it when he has to do it. Uh, but here, in fact, uh, this is Act 3, Scene 6, about line 105. Uh, one of uh, these uh, old friends of Henry, Bardolph, uh, we learn line 105, is like to be executed for robbing a church, if your majesty knows the man. Uh, now, again, it would help if we had read Henry IV, part one and two, and realized these are friends uh, of Henry's. But no mercy this time. Line 112, we would have all such offenders so cut off, and we have expressed charge that in our marches through the country, there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, uh, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language. Now, again, this is pretty impressive here. He wants to keep his soldiers from <coughs> the old fun of war, raping and pillaging. Though notice <coughs> the speech ends, top of 63, line 117, for when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. Uh, the strategy is actually utilitarian. Uh, uh, yes, it's good that he uh, uh, is merciful and he wants to limit uh, the collateral damage in war, but he quite explicitly says it's to be more successful. Uh, uh, that in, you know, we will have more success in France if we get our troops to behave themselves. So this is a very calculating figure. It's, again, a, a Machiavellian uh, basis for mercy. It's not, I am <coughs> merciful by disposition. Uh, I just can't bring myself <coughs> to do nasty things in France. It's, I understand I'll be more successful if I don't do these things. Uh, now, very quickly, I think I, I want to talk about the French here. Now, this, this is really wonderful. Uh, Shakespeare really doesn't miss a trick in this play. Uh, and we now get a, a scene, Act uh, 3, Scene 7, of the French. Uh, 
And I was once, I was lecturing on Henry V at a school in Minnesota, and they were doing a production of Henry V, uh, uh, and I was supposed to help them out with it. Uh, and the first thing they asked me was, uh, how do you do a Welsh accent? I don't know how you do a Welsh accent. But I said, be sure of one thing, do the French scenes with a Monty Python accent. Uh, uh, that is, do, uh, do this like, you know, the Holy Grail. At these, these, you should do the worst French accents you can possibly do. And I, I, I'm guessing that's how they did it in Shakespeare's day, that th these scenes are made to be, uh, make fun of the French. Uh, and what we see about them, uh, you see on page 65, uh, the French are in the Middle Ages. The English are in the Renaissance. The Renaissance meets the Middle Ages in this play, and the Renaissance wins. By that, I mean, just look at page 65, Act 3, Scene 7. Uh, I won't try to do a bad French accent, but uh, 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 tut, I have the best armor of the world, would it would day. You have an excellent armor, but let my horse have his due. It is the best horse of Europe. Uh, will it never be morning? My Lord of Orleans and my Lord High Constable, you talk of horse and armor. They are knights in shining armor. They are the flower of French civil chivalry. They are living still in the Middle Ages when knights in shining armor won battles. Uh, knights in shining armor will never win battles again, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the Battle of Agincourt uh, next time. But I want you to see how it's being set up here. These are men out of medieval chivalric romances. Uh, the, the, out of the poetry of Chrétien, uh, Chrétien de Troyes uh, and all those French romances. They are so, they live in a world of poetry. Though it's interesting, Shakespeare has them speak prose here, but look at the, the Dauphin speech, line 11. What a long night is this. Uh, I will not change my horse with any that treads but on four parts on the side. He bounds from the earth uh, as if his entrails were hair. Le cheval volant, the Pegasus. Uh, uh, it's also poetic, and they're out of touch with the earth. They're living in the world of Pegasus, of flying horses. Uh, and yeah, the, the speech, page uh, 66, so line 20 here. Uh, it is a beast for Perseus, again, a flying horse. He is pure air and fire, and the dull elements of earth and water never appear in him. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, like I'd rather have my horse to my mistress. They've written a sonnet. Uh, line 42, I once read a sonnet in his praise and began this wonder of nature. I've heard a sonnet begin so to one's mistress. Then did they imitate that which I composed to my courser. For my horse is my mistress. Again, this is Shakespeare having fun with the whole world of medieval love poetry, courtly love poetry, the poetry of chivalry. Uh, <clears throat> the French are so poetic here. They got such beautiful armor going to turn out the English have arrows that can pierce that armor. What we see here is the French uh, are, are still living in the world of the court. Indeed, we never see the French common soldiers here. We never see the French care about their common soldiers. If you go back to page uh, uh, 58, uh, the king uh, here, the French king, this is Act 3, Scene 5, gives a speech to rally the troops, but who's he rallying? Uh, you Dukes of Orleans, Bourbon, Berry, Alisson, Brabant, Bar Burgundy, you know, high Dukes, great princes, barons, lords, and knights. He never thinks, the French king never thinks to speak to the people. Uh, indeed, we never see the French foot soldiers at uh, this play. Henry speaks to the English people. Again, we'll be looking at Act 4 when he goes out among the people. One thing you see here, the French can't wait for the night to end because they can't wait to get into battle because it's going to be this great triumph for French chivalry. We see the English are so much more practical about this upcoming battle. They wish the night wouldn't end because they're outnumbered and they're afraid what's going to happen. That fear is going to translate into victory, whereas this French overconfidence is going to translate uh, into defeat here. Uh, really what happens at the Battle of Agincourt uh, uh, is 
the, the Middle Ages defeated by the Renaissance. Just quickly, I'll say, Shakespeare does not emphasize the military technological aspect of this battle. I'll just fill you in on the background, which I think Shakespeare would have expected any of his audience to know. Battle of Agincourt actually is one of the great turning points in military history. Uh, it's the moment uh, when uh, knights in shining armor were basically doomed. The British developed, uh, you know, a high-powered archery. They had these long bows, uh, and they could deliver armor-piercing arrows. And basically what they did is they set up a trap for the French. Uh, they let the French ride in uh, to this killing zone, which they'd set up, and they just mowed down these guys on their horses with their armor uh, with blasts. Of, you know, uh, uh, English longbow could really develop, uh, deliver a powerful arrow. They do this on the History Channel. They show tests of this. Uh, 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 and uh, if, uh, John Keegan's book, The Face of Battle, uh, is about four great battles in history. And one of them is Agincourt. Uh, in a way, the whole of the uh, medieval political situation depended upon the idea that a guy in armor on horse could defeat a lot of little guys on the ground with swords. But once you reach the point where an arrow could bring down a guy in armor on a horse, that was pretty much the end for chivalry. And historically, this Battle of Agincourt uh, was very significant for that. Now, Shakespeare does not emphasize that. He presents it as an act of God. You know, it is, according to all the accounts, uh, the, 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 the proportion of casualties was extraordinary. The French lost thousands and the British lost a handful of people. It does appear to be because of this trap that Henry set uh, for the French. Shakespeare, it's a drama. He wants to keep it personal. He wants to, Henry wants to present it as, uh, as this miracle uh, that happened. In fact, it was no miracle. It was just a triumph uh, of English technology here. But it is significant. Uh, it, uh, a parallel development was artillery. The whole medieval feudal order depended upon the idea uh, that these barons could build castles and they were fortified and nobody could attack them or would take months to besiege them and so on. Once they developed artillery that could bring down castle wars, the Middle Ages was doomed. And so I think Shakespeare goes out of his way here to create it's funny because it's a kind of stereotype we still have about the French. Uh, any French people here before I go on with this? Uh, that is, uh, uh, it is actually the Monty Python view of the French that they're somewhat effete and they're narcissistic and wrapped up in themselves. Uh, it's another way that Shakespeare is appealing <coughs> to the prejudice of his audiences. I think these scenes must have gotten big laughs. Uh, 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 in the day. So what I'm getting at is what we see here is a king who creates a citizen army. The closest you could get to a Roman army in the modern world. Uh, the French army shows everything that was wrong with medieval chivalry. It was based on a few nobles having their armor and their sense of honor and their lovely poems to their mistresses and thinking of themselves as fighting uh, for their chivalric honor. Uh, uh, Henry makes sure it's an army of good Englishmen who are fighting for England. One of the things that's really strong among the French is they're all fighting for their honor, by which they mean their personal honor so much so that the dolphin actually dissipates the king and doesn't show up where he's supposed to show up. Whereas Henry creates something that looks a lot more like the Roman army. Even Llewellyn is pleased with it because it's an army of people fighting for their country under uh, their leader. So I'll stop here. Next time we'll go on uh, and look at uh, uh, the Battle of Agincourt as Shakespeare presents it. Again, for handy